Have you ever done a search on pictures for heaven? <laughs> you know, there's, that, that, there's that incredible song that says, I can only imagine. I can only imagine what it will be like when we get there. Um, and, and, when we, and, and the, the, the part that I like that the song brings out is, I can only imagine what it will be like when I see Jesus face to face. And, and, and as the song goes on, will I stand, right? Or the part that gets me is, or will I fall to my knees? Because I got a feeling that a lot of us are going to be falling to our knees. So we'll be going in there. See, see now the child, the child will probably be different, right? The, the little kid is you know, running up there in Jesus, right? But, but, there, but, but some of us who have a little more history, <laughs> a little more <laughs> reason for him to die on the cross to, for sins, um, we're going to, oh, Jesus. But I also think, and I love that, I love that picture, uh, and I forget the, the, the artist that did it, but it's, but it's got this man, that, and, he, and he's obviously um, a, a man who works with his hands. He's probably a carpenter or something like that. There's tools there and all, and he's rugged and everything. And Jesus has his arms around him. All you see is the man's back. And Jesus has his arms wrapped around him, and the cross is behind him, and there's a flow of red coming out underneath them and it's because of the blood of Jesus Christ that cleanses us from all unrighteousness. And you see, there really is a sense, and we're going we're gonna to look at two, two sp specific passages this morning from Revelation 21 where he talks about the new heaven and new earth, but also John 10. And, and it's in interesting that when we look at John 10, I want to remind you that there's a very important phrase I'm not including in the message this morning. And that is in John 10:10, 10, 10, where Jesus says, I have come that you might have life and have it to the full. Uh, the King James says, I have come that you might have life abundantly. You see, heaven is not just for us to experience when we get there. What J Jesus is trying to help us understand is just that he wants to come and be a part of this life right now. That's why he says, I've come that you might have life and have it to the full. And so, so just realize that we're not just talking about pie in the sky by and by, okay? We're, we're not just, you know, talking about the sweet up there or whatever, right? But we're talking about something real and tangible that is significant, and it's all about relationship with God, and he wants us to start enjoying that yesterday, John 10, verse 27. <clears throat> my sheep listen to my voice. I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. No one can snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all. No one can snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and the Father are one. And Revelation 21 verses 4 and 5. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. And then he said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. So the pictures that came up when I did this search for pictures of heaven, images of heaven, at, at the top two pictures were seafood heaven. I'm like, what? <laughs> 
I, I guess there's a, there's a place or something, I don't know if it's on their menu or something like that. So, it, and, and it didn't even look, I'm sorry, it didn't even look that good. <laughs> okay, so I wasn't even going to show it to you because it, it okay, it, it, it was, you know, French fries and I believe there was some breaded fish uh, and maybe, there might have even been some shrimp in it or something like that, I don't know. But it's like, you know, okay, that's not my image of heaven. <laughs> It's, and it's interesting as I looked at some of the other images. And by the way, watch out. Because when I was looking at these images, do you know that there's some bad images that come up? There was even some people on there without clothing. Okay, so just you, you got to watch everything. Everywhere there's stuff that's bad. And, and oh man, that kind of bugged me too when I saw that. Yeah. Besides, I'm like, okay, now, now how do I look? And what if somebody walks in, you know, and all that kind of stuff? <laughs> Okay, but, but a lot of the pictures were the white cloud. And in fact, there were a whole bunch of just white cloud pictures. Well, and I understand that from our view, heavens, we look up, right? And there is a heaven out there, right? We, call, we talk about the heavens. I mean, don't you see it? in Sunrise, you all saw that this morning, right? Some of you are nodding here. It's, uh, yes, some of you are saying, don't look at me. I wasn't awake. <laughs> okay, how about sunset, right? We, we look into the heavens and we see all kinds of beauty, right? Uh, and, and we are privileged to look in the heavens to see a lot of blue sky most of the time and just some incredible things that God's blessed us with. So a lot of the pictures had white. There were pictures then that had a ladder. There were pictures that had kind of a, a walkway. Uh, and then and, and there's some unusual pictures. There, there were some pictures that like dark all around and then this like golden orange reddish um, kind of sort of like tower out there. And then there was the, the ones of this like golden, you could see like bright city and light coming, light coming out of the city, literally. And then there, there are people. And then, then there were the heaven is for real. There are even a couple of those pictures on there and, and then some other, I'm, I'm going to heaven. And, but, it's, but you know what? I really don't think any of them do justice. I think if you read Revelation that you'll see that John struggled at trying to explain what heaven looked like. As he, as he walks in there, as he sees this place that's lit up by the glory of God. And, and he tries to use what? He uses jewels and stones and gems and things like that to try to explain the color of it because it's just so incredible. For those of you who have um, seen or heard the story or read the story, Heaven is for Real, little Colton, um, he has some interesting descriptions of heaven. And, and he, talks about, he talks about Jesus riding a horse, right? Uh, and, and you know Jesus will ride a horse, right? He rode one earlier and he'll ride one when he comes back and it's not going to be too good. Okay. Well, but he says he sees him in heaven and what does he see? Oh, it's a, it's a, a horse that's got all the colors of the rainbow. Well, that's kind of a weird-looking horse, if you ask me. <laughs> yeah, some of the criticism of if heaven is for real is, is that's, um, in fact, the, the, the hardest criticism about the, about the book and the movie and the little boy are in the, probably three areas. Number one, they did it just to make money because they were financially struggling. Ouch, that sounds pretty judgmental and critical. Um, um, secondly, um, it's not biblical, and the, what they use to say it's not biblical is they say, look, he said that he saw God, and God had yellow hair and blue eyes. And we all know that the Bible doesn't say what God looks like. So therefore, it's not biblical. The, he also says that he saw Jesus, and Jesus had greenish blue eyes and brown hair. Well, again, the Bible doesn't tell us, so therefore, it's not biblical. You know, I'm not sure that those are the reasons why I would say whether it was biblical or not biblical. I'm going to look at more significant issues. What does he say about God? What does he say about... And, and, and the thing that stood out when he, when he was asked questions about God, Colton always says, God loves us. God loves us. What did he look like? God loves us. That's the thing that stands out from this young boy as he's coming back. And, and, and he, did he have an experience in heaven or not? God knows. God knows. What's, what's Colton's concern? When Colton was asked why he shared all this, he says, because 
I just want people to know that heaven is for real. That sounds biblical to me, doesn't it? God loves, that sounds biblical. That Now, oh, but here's another one that's probably not biblical. That uh, a miscarried baby just two months along in the, in the birth process actually came up to him and says, I'm your sister, and hugs him. And he tells mom and dad about having met his little sister. And they're like, how did you, I mean, how did you know this? Because they hadn't shared anything with him. It was five years before he was born. And they had kind of pushed it away because it's hard to deal with a miscarriage. And it was two months along, so they, they said, you know, we, we didn't do it. And, and, and the, they asked, mom asked, what, what, what was the name of the little girl? And what did she look like? And she des he describes her as being red hair like her, not like her other sister. The other sister, I think, has blonde hair, if I remember correctly. But she doesn't, so she's got hair like mom, looks like mom, and um, she's a little bit shorter than the other sister. And then she says, uh, well, uh, well what's, what's her name? And Colton says, Mom, she didn't have a name because you and Daddy didn't name her. And that was truth. So there's things like that that one would say, wow, this sounds like a very, very legitimate true story. We are told to test the spirits, aren't we? And to assess whether things are true. And what is the tool that we're supposed to use to test the spirits? The Word of God, right? The Word of God. And I would just encourage you, not just with a movie like Heaven is for Real or the book, but anything that you're looking at, test it with the Word of God. This week, we uh, attended... Shauna's not here, is she? No. Okay. Whoa. Was anyone else at the meeting that I went to with Shauna this week? The Republican women's meeting? Is no one here, there? Okay, well, we heard about something called um, Agenda 21, and, and uh, as, as the whole conversation went on, the, there was just details of details of things of how we're moving into a more negative, worse time, one world government, one world religion. I mean, we're, we're seeing this, right? And I'm sitting there as I'm listening to all this stuff, and, and, and I'm saying, um, what you're sharing really isn't news, <laughs> It's, it's all in Revelation. You can see it if you read the Bible. And here's, the, here's one of the challenges, isn't it? Have you ever noticed how sometimes we Christians get worked up? Just a little? Stressed, stressed about this world? Okay? And the things that are happening in this world? Folks, the end is going to come. I don't know when, neither do you. The Antichrist is going to rule and evil will take its place, and then Jesus will return, and evil will be destroyed. And it will get nasty in the process. But do you remember one other thing that Jesus said when he was with the disciples just before he leaves? He gave us a commission. He said, we're supposed to go into all the world, and we're supposed to preach the good news. What's the good news? That Jesus Christ died and rose from the dead to forgive us of our sins, and he's coming back to give us new life. Isn't that the good news? We're supposed to go out, and we're supposed to share that, and we're supposed to help people become disciples, meaning we're supposed to teach them to obey what Jesus taught. All of us, our job here, not just mine, your job and my job, if you know Jesus Christ, is to help one another become more like Jesus Christ. We're in a process of becoming like him. But we're in a world that's turning away from him. And according to the Bible, it's going to get worse before it gets better. In fact, it's just going to get bad. So what's our job? Keep living for Jesus because what did Jesus say at the end of that statement? He says, hey. He didn't say hey, he said lo. <laughs> he didn't even say that because he spoke in Aramaic. <laughs> Translated, he said, I'm with you always to the end of the age. Oh my, that's our promise, isn't it, folks? Heaven's coming sometime. All of us are going to get the privilege to go there if we know Jesus Christ, not because we earned it, not because we're so good, because we're actually not, and we don't deserve to get there at all, but because we accept payment by Jesus Christ, we get to go to heaven. It's, it's just all about Him. I'm with you always. So no matter what's happening in the politics, 
if the Antichrist is putting up his, his statue in the place of the temple and the world is worshiping because he's been risen himself from the dead. By the way, that's in the Bible. And if that's happening and that's before our eyes, don't forget, I am with you to the end of the age. And that's why Jesus talks about heaven. Not to take us out of here, but to remind us that he's greater than the worst of the worst. To remind us that he's here with us. That he's actually trying to bring heaven into the worst of times to make himself known to us. So he says, look, my sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. First John says, the world and its desires pass away, but whoever does the will of God, what? Lives forever. No one who denies the Son has the Father. Whoever acknowledges the Son has the Father also. As for you, see that what you have heard from the beginning remains in you. If it does, you also remain in the Son and in the Father. And this is what he promised us, eternal life. What is eternal life? One with Christ and the Father. And look at, if you look at our text, what our text said is, is that we are going to remain in the hands of God. And nothing is going to be able to snatch us out of, pull us away from, not even gravity, folks. You're hanging on. Nothing can take you out of the hands of God. Earlier in John 10, he said, verse 4, he says, when he has brought out all his own, he goes on ahead of them and his sheep follow him because they know his voice. But they will never follow a stranger. In fact, they will run away from him because they do not recognize a stranger's voice. Jesus says, my sheep listen to my voice. They know my voice. Do you know it? Do we recognize the voice of Jesus Christ when he's speaking to us? when he's trying to communicate to us. Because even in something like a movie that may or may not be about God, right? We can test and see whether Jesus is speaking through that or not. Are we listening for the voice of Jesus? He goes on, he says, my sheep follow me. My sheep follow me. Now, it's an interesting phrase there because to follow means to walk on the road together with me. It means to be a companion going the same way. That's what Debbie committed to, 1975, in front of a whole congregation of people. She said, I'm going to walk with you through the journey of life, right? Come on, anybody who's been married, that's what you've been doing. And, and everyone knows that once you ha have that wedding day, everything's wonderful after that. I mean, it is, right? Am, am, am I missing something here? <laughs> well, that's the way you all look on Sunday. You all look like you have wonderful marriages and never anything is wrong, right? Because you're what? Oh, on Thursday. <laughs> But isn't, it, now think about this. So when you're standing there at that altar and getting married, aren't you thinking about, I'm going to live with this person for the rest of my life. We're going to grow old. I hear, I hear them say this, right? When we do premarital counseling, we're going to grow old together. You really looking forward to that? <laughs> <laughs> I can't wait for her to see all my wrinkles and, you know, <laughs> and the other stuff. <laughs> <laughs> oh my <laughs> what are we living for to share life together to be a companion to walk down the road together um, I like and guys you, guys you get this come on don't we like to do things with somebody beside us right and we're, we're not real comfortable with the face to face stuff okay that's your girls okay but, but we guys we're, we kind of like to be shoulder to shoulder. We're going to go onto that battlefield, arm in arm, right, next to one another, and we're going to fight that fight together, right? Okay. There, there's a sense of, of camaraderie as we go down the road together. Are, are you riding the bike, Mike? Yeah. 
Okay, there, there's a sense of camaraderie. We're riding, riding down the, the road together. And, and, and Jesus says, look, follow me. Follow me. Go down the road with me. Okay, walk with me. Be my companion as you go through life. How did he say it then to the disciples? He says, he, King James says, follow me and I'm going to make you what? I'm going to make you fishers of men. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to take whatever you've been doing and I'm going to now use that for, for good and to make a difference in other people's lives. If you'll follow me, we'll do this together, folks. Follow me. You see, if you listen to my voice, you're going to understand. And if you'll follow me, if we'll go in this together, we're going to make a difference in our world regardless whether the Antichrist is here or not. So he says, whoever does not, oh, this is a tough one, Matthew 10, 38. Did I print it in that little outline I gave you? There's actually an outline in your bulletin, surprise, surprise. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's for those of you who want to go to sleep while I'm talking. No. <laughs> Matthew 10, verse 38. Whoever does not take up their cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Are you aware of when Jesus said that? Let me just give you the point. It's before he died. He didn't go to the cross yet. It's probably a year or two more before he's going to the cross. And he says, and he says, whoever does not take up their cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Doesn't take up their cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Jesus said that to a group of people who didn't know the meaning of the cross yet. Their view of the cross was probably for most of them, they had been there when there had been an uprising and a few hundred guys were put on crosses right down the road in Jerusalem so that everyone would see you don't fight against Rome. And it had no meaning like when he will die on it. He's saying it before that. That's amazing, isn't it? He's saying, unless you pick up your cross, unless you're, you're willing to face whatever difficulty might be ahead and follow me. Wow. John 8 says, when Jesus spoke again to the people, he said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. As we follow Jesus, he gives us understanding. He gives us the strength. He gives us ability gives us confidence to face the darkness so we don't have to be worried about the dark in second timothy what did paul say that's why i'm suffering as i am i got a text this morning from daryl we have not been praying for the church around the world that's suffering and now it may be our turn maybe but there are Christians suffering severely around the world, and we need to be praying for them. And Paul says, that's why I am suffering as I am. Yet this is no cause for shame, because I know whom I have believed. And I am convinced that he's able to guard what I have entrusted to him until that day. Until what day? Until the day it's over, until the day I go to heaven, until the day I see him face to face, I know I can trust him with my life. My sheep follow me. Why? Because they trust me. First John says this way in verse, chapter 3. He says, Dear friends, now we are children of God, and what we will be has not yet been made known. But we know that when Christ appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. All who have this hope in him purify themselves just as he is pure. No one who lives in him keeps on sinning. No one who continues to sin has either seen him or known him. Hmm. The more we get to know the G Jesus, the closer we're going to become to him. The more we're going to see what he's like. Also, it should start changing the way we sin or not. Right? And one of the keys that helps you to avoid sin is to put your eyes on Jesus. Remember you're walking with him beside you. So you get and you do the search for the pictures for heaven and you see something there that you shouldn't look at. <laughs> right? Jesus is beside you. 
What's your temptation? Jesus is beside you, your companion. And if you'll allow him, he'll give you the help you need to be victorious over those, that temptation. And then John 12 says, whoever, verse 26, whoever serves me must follow me. And where I am, my servant also will be. My father will honor the one who serves me. And Jesus said it another way, didn't he? He says, if you're feeding the sick, if you're helping the poor, if you're visiting the prisoner, if you're giving somebody who's thirsty something to drink, you're doing it what for and to him. And so he's saying, we need to be serving Jesus. My sheep follow me. What does that, that also mean? They do what I do. I came to serve, Jesus said. Your job is to serve. And Jesus said, what happens to his sheep who follow him? He says, I give them eternal life. And that's when we move back to our text in Revelation. What's eternal life? He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more mourning, no more crying, no more pain. Why might there be tears in your eyes when you're in heaven? Because take note. This is after heaven's already come down. You're already there in, in heaven, right? And enjoying the goodness of God. Why would there be tears that he'd be wiping from your cheeks? Well, there's probably a couple of reasons why you might be crying when you're standing there in heaven. You might be crying because you're still remembering what you did on earth. You might be crying because of, you're seeing now all that God wanted to give you and you're realizing all that you missed while you were here that he wanted to put in your hands. So there might be the tears of regret in heaven. That's possible, yes? Isn't that why we would be humbled and bowing down before him because we're, we're maybe crying over regret? But I think there's an even bigger one. I think there will be the tears for the people that we knew that we wanted to be in heaven. And when we're all there, we'll see. So now we see as through a glass dimly. Then we shall see face to face. We're, we're going to be looking at Jesus face to face. Now we know in part. Then we shall be fully known. We're going to know and understand things then that we don't know now. We'll have recognition of who's there. And w whether this movie is true or not, it, it gives us some insights, doesn't it? Doesn't Jesus know people in heaven? Um, in his own, one of his own stories about heaven, he talked about Lazarus and a rich man. And he calls Lazarus, who was a poor beggar sitting outside on the street with sores on his skin. And he calls him by name and identifies him. He knows people there. And it's Jesus who will say in his conversation then in that story that even though someone come back from the dead, they will not believe. It's Jesus who weeps for the rich man and the rich man's brothers who are probably not going to accept Christ either. And Jesus weeps. So why might there be weeping in heaven? For the burden, the pain, the sadness, the grief that we might feel. And, and the good news is, is that he says he's going to wipe those tears from our eyes. He's going to take away the pain. He's going to take away the grief. So if, we're, if the grief is because of sin, thank you, Jesus. <laughs> the guilt's gone, the shame, the embarrassment, all the stuff that's held us back, all the things that we've allowed to limit us in, in this world, it's gone. There's no more mourning, no more crying, no more pain. There is no more reason to be regretting and thinking about death because now we're celebrating life. It's eternal and forever. And, and the stuff that caused you heartache here is no longer going to be your burden. And you're set free. Heaven, folks, don't buy into Hollywood's picture of the clouds and the harp. What is it, Steve Jobs? There was a commercial, a cartoon of Steve Jobs. He gets to heaven and he brings the harp and he's, a, and he's in white and everything else is in white. You know, and he comes up to Peter or somebody and says, um, I think we need to get a new version of this. <laughs> Well, I guess we will be our own selves in heaven, but 
I don't think we're going to be having that little stringed harp and all sitting out there on the clouds. In fact, what, what, what Revelation tells us, there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth. Now, if you can just imagine, imagine this world. Do, do you like some things about it? You all live on the mountain, folks. Come on, this is beautiful up here. Have you seen the blue sky out there today? Yes? I mean, what a privilege. It's gorgeous. And sometimes we even get to have snow too, right? Come on, more celebration. <laughs> they're, 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 it's just an amazing creation that we get to enjoy here. How many of you like steaks? Okay, if you're not a meat eater, how many of you like vegetables grilled? Okay, uh, okay. If you, if you don't like good, good food like that, how many of you like ice cream? <laughs> Thank you, Fred. <laughs> okay. Folks, the best part of what we have here isn't going to compare to the better that we're going to have there. New heaven and new earth. Um, and, and, and there's going to be challenges. And, and will we know all of God? He says he'll know us. Will we know all of God? Or will it take an eternity to know all of God? Climb another mountain, learn another thing. In fact, I, I, I probably should go ahead and share what um, John Piper said. He closed the sermon this way, with a scene from your life. It is the hour of your dying. You're in the hospital. It is the middle of the night. Your best beloved has fallen, fallen asleep from exhaustion on the chair. And she's sitting, or he's sitting beside your bed. But now a storm begins to rage as Satan throws all his final force against your faith. You feel the reality of eternity like you have never felt it before. The wind of doubt and the waves of fear lash your soul. And then, by the grace of God, there comes a scene. And it is your scene. You are in a boat, in a storm, and Jesus is approaching you on the water, and on his face there is no fear. With his hair and his cloak flying in the wind, he stops a short way off and stands with his strong arms relaxed at his side in sovereign peace. And from the boat, with one last heart-rending glance at your beloved asleep in the chair, you say, Christ, bid me come. And he says, come. And you begin to walk on the water. But then in the final instant, you, utter, you are utterly overwhelmed with what is happening. I am dying. I am dying. This water is so deep. It is dark. It is cold and filled with hideous creatures. For fear, you begin to sink. But the promise of Jesus never fails. And with a mighty hand, he seizes your arm and pulls you to himself. The storm ceases, and there is a great, beautiful calm upon the sea, and it is over. And you know, like you never imagined you could know, that Jesus is precious because he has given you eternal life. Most of us will be afraid as we face that moment. Most of us will be tempted to look at the circumstances and be nervous and perhaps fr afraid of, of that passageway we call death. But standing right there will be the one who has promised that nothing will ever be able to take us out of his hand. That nothing will able, be able to separate us from his love. It's what he said in Romans 8. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword, as it is written, for your sake, 
We face death all day long. We are considered to be sheep as slaughtered. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through Him who loved us. For I am convinced, are you? For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. That's the promise that Jesus has given to us about heaven. The hands of God. When you say yes to Jesus Christ, the hands of God will never let you go. And nothing will be able to take you away from Him. And did you notice the list of stuff there? Neither things present or things to come. That, that means nothing in the future is going to be able to take you from, away from the hands of God. Neither what? Oh my, not even demons. And that's your demons, the ones you've chosen that are not spiritual at all. They're just your, your sins that you keep committing. And that's the supernatural ones too. The ones that try to keep us away from God, keep us from honoring God. Nothing can separate us from the love of God, can take us out of the hands of God. Nothing. And I'm sorry. I would encourage you not to follow those who would say, but you can. But you can take yourself away. And you can take yourself away. And, and you can do it. No, because he has just promised nothing. <coughs> not what is here now or in the future. So Spurgeon said it this way. I do not know in what other way to preach from this text than the one in which I am preaching from it. Somebody says, oh, that is Calvinism. I do not care what it is. It is scriptural. I have this inspired book before me, and I cannot see any meaning in the words before me if they do not mean that those who have received life from the Lord Jesus have an endless inheritance. I cannot make them mean anything else. I give unto my sheep eternal life, is what Jesus said. That must mean that believers are eternally secure. <clears throat> Do you have something to share with Jesus? You see, as secure as you are, he's still saying, follow me. And he still knows that you may have stuff that dirties up the water, <laughs> that hinders you from following him well. He knows that you're distracted at times and you want to you wanna follow some other things sometimes. You want to bring some other companions along and he knows it's not going to be good for you. Would you be willing to share that with him? I've asked you to share your prayer needs, but, but is there something more that maybe you need to admit to God? God, I want to give this to you as well because this is what I'm fighting. And I'd encourage you to write it down, even if you don't put your name on it. Right? Frankly, right now, the name doesn't matter because Jesus knows who's writing. <laughs> but would you give even your sin to him today? Because he's already promised nothing can separate you from his love. Nothing. Would you be willing to give him your sin? And we're going to do it, like I said, in a very unusual way. I'm going to ask you to walk up here and put it on the communion table now's your opportunity
Not only did Jesus die for our sins, he died to give us life. And may I challenge you, maybe you need to make a new commitment today to live your life for Jesus Christ.